Okay, let's finish this chapter looking at karst landscapes and mass movements. Just as a review, so what would you think would be the most common type of weathering that would occur in a landscape like this, physical or chemical? How about that landscape? What would be the most common type that you would see there, physical weathering or chemical weathering? That would be a great exam question. Okay, karst topography. Karst topography or karst landscapes um, happened in happen in areas that have have uh, limestone parent rock, and these are going to be um, seen as landscapes that are pitty, bumpy. They have sinkholes. There's underground streams, caves, caverns, and sinking hidden rivers. And you're going to use a little Google Map activity this week to look at one. Uh, karst landscape in Florida and in Kentucky. But these are very common in places like Jamaica, Puerto Rico, Turkey, the United States. We even have a little karst landscape in southern Oregon. So what that tells you about these places is that they have all been at some point ocean floors, which is pretty amazing when you think of all of these uh, above ground locations currently. So. How does karst landscapes, how do these happen? So these are chemical weathering areas um, as a result of uh, the calcium being removed and re uh, recreated as calcite. Um, so here's an example of groundwater penetrating into a limestone uh, parent rock. And what that does, it creates pipes and uh, caves that coalesce or come together and then the ground above can no longer be supported and it will fall in creating ponds and sinkholes and in some places like in Mammoth Caves um, it has evacuated whole areas of uh, the, the subsurface and then the calcium that is removed can then be redeposited in the form of calcite dripstones, so stalactites and stalagmites. So this would be an underground uh, look at this. This is the way this might look on the surface. You have holes um, throughout. It's pretty, I would think it would be a very dazzling place to uh, go jogging. So karst landscapes, take a look at those in the book. Uh, make sure you understand the processes there. Mass movements are uh, another term for just material moving down slope. Okay, so you always have slope involved, um, and um, the steepness of the slope or the, the mass movement is determined by the size of the material and what's called the angle of repose. So the angle of repose is different depending on uh, if you're looking at sand or gravel, you can make a much steeper cliff or a much steeper angle of repose with clay material than you can with uh, sand material. So in order to have a landslide, you have to get that slope to fail. And so there's a, a little equation we're going to talk about where the driving forces have to overcome uh, the resistance forces. And the driving forces of a mass movement is just the gravity. What's pulling that material off the slope, down slope? And um, this is contributed by the, the weight, so heavier material is going to have a heavier driving force, the size and the shape of the material, and also the amount of moisture. Sometimes, uh, especially in Oregon, very wet hillsides tend to be heavier, and that water creates kind of a, a push or a slickness that allows material to fail or to fall more rapidly than dry material. And also, uh, you can, you can uh, categorize landslides or slope failure by the speed. So a fall or a topple would be uh, very fast and a slide might be a little slower. So here's an example of a walk, uh, rock fall. This is happening pretty much instantaneously. And where uh, something like this where you just have a bit of a slope failure of where these rocks are falling slowly over time, oh, you know, eight feet by eight feet as uh, the uh, material underneath becomes removed maybe in a flash flood or maybe a little ground shaking would, would break that loose. This is an example of a kind of fall where the material has uh, fallen just 
probably from physical weathering, maybe a little chemical weathering off the slope. They haven't landed very far. And these create what are called talus slopes or cones of debris. Here's a well-defined talus slope coming off these mountain sides. And you can get huge landscapes of talus slopes called bajadas. Uh, make sure you understand or you, you look at all of those processes. There's a great example on uh, 10 two of a talus slope. A landslide, however, is a sudden rapid movement of material. Uh, typically a landslide is not saturated with water and I want you to be able to define two different types of landslides, a traditional or translational landslide and a rotational slump. Your um, activity this week using Google Maps will also have you look at two very classic examples of these two landforms. So, we're looking back at this design of the driving forces have to overcome the resisting forces. So here is a, a rock segment on, on a slope. Part of what's holding this material down is gravity forcing this way and the frictional forces and cohesion that are at the base of this rock. So if something happens, maybe the ground shaking begins to happen or you get water flow underneath that that's going to break those resistance forces and let the gravity in this uh, area pull that rock down the slope. Okay, so a slump, a, um, oops, I dreamt one, I'm sorry. So if resistance force is greater than um, the driving force, you're going to have stability, it's not going to move. But if your resistance force is less than your driving force, you're going to have slope failure. All right, so the two kinds, the rotational slump, we'll talk about that first. So here's kind of the criteria of a rotational slump. Basically, they have a concave surface, and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, the, the slump is has what's called backward rotation. It looks like someone has pulled the rug out from under. Everything's toppled kind of backwards. They have a very curved base. Often along that back slope there's ponds. Um, the width and the length of these landforms are very similar and they often generate what's called a little lip and there's no toe. So we'll look at this in a, in a little cartoon here. So here's an example of the head scarp or the breakaway point of this landslide. And you can see this curved shape where it's kind of, uh, you can just imagine where somebody's just pulled the rug out from under this. And I'm going to fix that word right there. There's the toe. Uh, the toe is that end or the material that's kind of uh, at the bottom of the landslide. It hasn't gone very far. It's not very big. There's the backwards rotation. These trees that were up here in the original position are pointed back. And so this is a great place for water to collect. Here's an example. In, uh, you're going to look at some of these along Summer Lake in Oregon. Again, you get that backwards rotation. If you look at the length of the slide and the width of the slide, they're very similar. There hasn't been a lot of movement. Um, it's just kind of slumped down. It's just dropped. Uh, drop down from the head scarf to the toe. And here's an example of uh, a rotational slump. Water's ponded in this area and there's this kind of lip down at the end. There's another example of this slope. So there's the uh, top slope. This is the material that was up there. It's fallen. Uh, hasn't gone very far. Here's another one not so good for those folks. Often at the top of a slump along a roadway, you'll begin to see these curves, uh, cracks, and sometimes they're the first indication that there is movement down below or that, that slope is beginning to fail. You'll get those head cracks. And there's one uh, that just developed into, into a slide. Again, rotational crack. These cracks were probably uh, visible and often this is what you see people road, or road crews working on to replace. A translational slide looks much, much different in geomorphology. So you look at the length and the width. Um, they are not equal, much longer. And this one you can't see the toe because it has fallen into the water. Um, this is La Conchita coastal area in Southern California. This is a nice uh, example of a landslide. Here's the head scarp. Um, you get these side channels where the material is uh, 
kind of broken away from these edges. The toe is moving. This is a very wet slide um, that keeps happening. It's kind of a continuous slide. This is the slide, the Slumgullion slide. You're going to look at this uh, this week also on Google Maps. Um, this is the head scarp where that material broke away. These are the edges of the slide. It's very well defined, but look how the toe is flowed out. It's very well developed. And there's another landslide uh, that's movement. A couple other types of mass movements are flows. Uh, landslides are typically dry. A flow has a lot of moisture in it and you can get earth flows or mud flows. They're very fast. This is an example um, of a mud flow down the side um, that well, speaks for itself. So very fast, very wet. Another type of mass movement is called creep. And these are long time, uh, almost soil particle by soil particle movements down slope. So make, make sure you look at that. Some of the landforms that are created from creep are what are called gunstock trees or bent trees. And these are just over time as the soil moves, the tree tends to right itself because of photosynthesis, that attraction toward the sun. Um, and here's a final example of creep. You can see these fence lines are moving out. They probably were vertical when they were placed in the ground, but over time they've kind of moved uh, as the soil has moved. And then make sure you take a look at this um, example on page 356. really shows you the difference between uh, types of, of movement, the speed, the water. It has a great kind of uh, diagram on um, what are, which are drier, which are wetter, which um, are happening slowly and which are happening quickly. And then really to be able to understand the morphology or the shape of these two, a rotational slump landslide or a translational landslide.